اوکے اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم فسٹ آف آل آئی وانٹ ٹو ویلکم آل آف یو ٹو Okay, so we are going to, uh, inshallah, start today uh, our course, Introduction to Islamic Sciences. So first of all, it is uh, very important to know that uh, this course is just an introductory course, and we are going to have very brief discussion about uh, different branches of Islamic Sciences, and there are different branches of Islamic sciences. And after completing this course, we will be able to uh, uh, understand the basic and fundamental principles of understanding of Islamic thought. So this course is very important for all of us. If we uh, want to really understand uh, Islamic uh, issues and Islam in itself, So uh, there are five important uh, branches that hopefully we are going to discuss in this course. One is uh, theology, which is related to Islamic theology, and we are going to discuss today, inshallah, and we will start this one. And the second is jurisprudence. Uh, we say it fiqh or fiqa. So jurisprudential aspect is different from the theological aspect. And the third is uh, philosophy or Islamic philosophy, and then mysticism and ethics. So we have these five or six branches or Islamic sciences. We need to understand and we need to uh, pay attention to these sciences. And when we talk about when we are going to have this course, uh, we Uh, need to understand the learning goals as well. Our learning goals are, for example, uh, we are going to start this course. And once we have finished this one, then uh, we will be able to understand and we will have the foundation and basic structure of Islamic thought. Because it is very important if we don't have the basic structure, if we don't have the fundamentals of uh, uh, Islamic thought, then we will not be able to Islamic issues. And this is why sometimes we attend the lectures, majalis, and we uh, are not able to understand properly or at the deeper levels. The reason is lack of, of foundation and uh, a structural understanding. So this is why we have, uh, uh, we are going to inshallah discuss in detail and then, but it will be just introductory. So uh, the learning goal, uh, when we are talking about the learning goals. So first of all, this is foundational course and we will have the basic structure Second, whenever we are reading something about religion, not only Islam, but whenever we are listening something, we are paying attention to uh, Islamic issues or there are speeches and majalis and we are participating in it. So it will be very easy for us to distinguish theological issues, uh, ethical issues, jurisprudential issues from each other. So if we are mixing up these issues and we don't know under what category the issue is being discussed, we will not be able to understand. This is why uh, I'm focusing on the second learning goal that we will have the ability, we will have this potential after completing this course 
to distinguish theological issues from jurisprudential issues, from philosophical issues, from mystical issues. Uh, and we are not going to mix, mix up in our life. Uh, another thing is the, our basic text is, uh, will be mm, the books of Ayatollah Murtaza Mutahari. So he has a very good writings on introduction to Islamic sciences. And we uh, are inshallah going to read the text and I will explain uh, what Ayatollah Mutahari is saying and then uh, we will read the text and I will explain um, properly so you will be able to understand. So he is very unbiased and his approach is uh, very objective. So the course we are going to start today is uh, not only for Shia Muslims, but this can be related to any denomination of Muslim sects. They can be Sunni, they can be Shia, whatever they can be, but they are going to, uh, they are going to, uh, uh, someone is calling me, sorry. Uh, So we, uh, we are going to have this uh, approach from Shaheed Mutahari, if you are Sunni, if someone is Shia. So for everyone, it is important and it is beneficial for every person. The other point is, I will go over the text and explain whenever and uh, wherever it is needed. And then starting point is introduction to uh, our uh, theology and Islamic theology. So when we talk about uh, theological issue and the first science or first branch is uh, important for us, which is Islamic theology. So again, I'm just repeating it that this uh, Islamic theology is important. Uh, we are going to start this one. And theology is related to uh, our intellectual aspect, our aqaid, when we say aqida, when we say our belief system. So our belief system is related to uh, the science of theology. Uh, when we have intellectual approach, when we have thinking aspect, so this is related to theology. So for example, if I am uh, a theologian, so it is important to know for all of us in the beginning that being a theologian, for example, I am uh, an ex uh, I'm expert of theology. So what are your expectations for me? How you will see me? For example, if a, a doctor is there, if medical doctor is there, so you know, you know your expectations from him, you know, uh, what may be his or her duties and responsibilities. So you can easily understand. Similarly, if there is a professor of mathematics, so you will have understanding about your expectations from him. And you know that what are his or her duties and responsibilities. So the question should arise, when you see someone who is theologian and who is specialized in uh, theology or Islamic theology or Christian theology. So the issue is that uh, what we should expect from this person? Uh, what are the responsibilities of uh, theologian? So for example, if I say that I am theologian, so my uh, duties are three. There are three duties for me. So one is uh, if I am uh, the specialist of theology, and I am expert in this area. So it means that now this will be my duty to defend Islam, because I am Islamic theologist. If my subject is Islamic theology, and I am expert in this area. So it means that if there are doubts, if there is a criticism, so in uh, YouTube, you see uh, in social media, there are a lot of questions. People are questioning a lot. 
So these are theological issues. So I need to defend my religion. If I don't have understanding of theology, if I am not expert in theology, then I will not be able to defend my religion. I will not be able to respond to those who are questioning me, who are criticizing me. So this is why uh, this issue is important for, uh, for all of us that we uh, are going to uh, discuss this theology and the responsibilities we may need to uh, know about this. The second responsibility is being a theologian. I'm going to uh, uh, draw the lines. I will tell the people and then community members that, uh, uh, that you have your boundaries. For example, if you are associated with a Shia thought or Shia Islamic sect, then there are uh, boundaries, there are limitations, and you need to uh, keep yourself within the boundaries. And you need to understand that we cannot uh, cross the boundaries. So being a theologian, I have to define it. I have to draw the lines. I have to tell you the limitations. If you want to say that you are Shia or ahl bayt or you are Sunni, then being a theologian, I have to explain this, that what you need to do, what you need to think, and about your aqaid and about your aqidah. So this is the second responsibility of uh, the one who is expert in theology. The third thing is, again, if I am specialized in Islamic theology, now it is my duty to provide the logical arguments, to provide the intellectual basis of our belief system. Because for example, uh, being a Muslim or being a Shia Muslim, okay, you have a lot of questions in your mind. You want to know that why I should believe in God, why I should believe in the day of judgment, why I should pray, why I should fast. And there are a lot of questions about Imamat, about the day of judgment, about the resurrection day. So who will answer you? Who will respond to you? There must be someone to tell you how you can defend yourself. If you are in the college, if you are in the school, if your uh, uh, students and then your friends are asking you question, and you are not able to answer this one. So it means that we are not paying attention to the logical strength or the argument or the uh, intellectual basis of whatever we are believing. So these are the three basic uh, responsibilities of uh, one theologian. And from this explanation, we can also understand uh, the meaning of theology. We can understand the limitations of theology. We can understand the essence of theology. So this was uh, something that I wanted to share with you. And in the end of, inshallah, our every session, you will have 10 minutes uh, to discuss, for example, share your ideas. If you have any question, you can ask this question. But I am not familiar with this new system, Zoom. So I may have some difficulties, but uh, next time, so I will go over each and every option. So I will be, I will have more control on it. So today, uh, first of all, we are going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to share with you uh, very important, uh, the book which I mentioned. So uh, this book is, Yeah, so uh,
Yeah, so you can see here, uh, so I am just sharing this screen. So an introduction to uh, Ilme Kalam. And this is the book that we are going to inshallah have uh, our, uh, this in, in our course. And today we are going to start the introduction to Ilme Kalam. This is from uh, Ayatollah Murtaza Mutahri. And uh, uh, we will inshallah go over um, the different uh, aspect of this book. So we are going to start from here, the beginning of Kalam. I'm going to read it and then uh, I will explain. So first thing is, uh, Ayatollah Mutari says, though nothing definite can be said about the beginning of ilm kalam among Muslims, what is certain is that discussion of some of the problems of kalam, such as the issue of predestination and free will, and that the divine justice became current among uh, Muslims during the first half of the second century of Hijra. Perhaps the first uh, formal center of such discussions was the circle of Hassan al-Basri. So you can see what he is saying, that we don't have exact information about uh, uh, the historical background of ilm -e kalam uh, between Muslims. We cannot say exactly when it has started, but he's saying that there were some discussions in the second half of the first century. And these discussions were very important. These discussions were related to predestination like jabr and free will ikhtiyar. You know, all of us are interested to, uh, to discuss this issue. And all of us are always asking this question that whatever we are doing, our actions, our amal, uh, whether we are majboor or we are compelled to do this one, uh, God has already decided for us that what we are going to do or what we are not going to do. Or do we have any willpower? So, or everything is already uh, decided for us. So this is related to the issue of predestination and free will. Whether we have free will, whether we can do whatever we want, or we are not able to do whatever we want, but everything has been determined for us. And this is kind of, uh, we are being forced to do something. So these kind of discussions were there. And then there was another discussion that what is the meaning of divine justice? What is the meaning of just of God? Uh, so divine justice is always there. For example, nowadays, uh, there is a coronavirus. There is a very uh, difficult time for whole humanity. And people are sometimes asking now, they are questioning God. They are questioning the just of God, that hundreds of thousands of people are dying and they are suffering. They are facing calamities, but they are not able to, uh, uh, there is no cure uh, and there are no other issues. So this is why we, uh, we have the, uh, the topic of just of God or justice of God. And then we need to discuss that, why God is not involving, why God is not helping us when we are praying a lot, we are supplicating a lot. So this is why uh, these were the discussions at that time. And gradually we see that uh, this theology uh, this evolved, and then we have uh, Ilm Kalam. And then he says, so people are coming late, and then I have to sometime uh, yeah, admit them. Yeah, the second issue is saying that among the Muslim uh, personalities of the later half of the first century, the name of Ma'bad al-Johani and the uh, Ghailan ibn Muslim al-Damishki have been mentioned who 
defended the ideas of free will and men's freedom. So these two personalities were there who said that, okay, we have free will, we have options, and God will, uh, res uh, we will be responsible and we will be accountable before God. So whatever we are doing, it is because of our will and this is, there is no jabra, there is no compulsion and there is no force on us. So there were other who opposed them and supported predestination. So some other scholars were there and they were not accepting this. Work. This was a little bit uh, historical background and gradually the point of difference between the two groups extended a series of other issues in theology, physics, sociology, and other problems related to men and the resurrections. So some other issues were also related to this discussion about the day of judgment, about the resurrection, of which the problem of Jabr and uh, Ikhtiar was only one. So during the period of Qadriya came to be called Mu'tazila and Jabriya became known as Ashari. So this is very important in the beginning. We just memorize this one. We don't need to go into the detail, but it is important for us to understand that there are three theological schools. One is called Mu'tazila, and they are from Sunni school of thought, and other is Jabriya, and uh, they are also from Sunni, which are Ash'ari, so we have Mu'tazila and Ashari, and then we have Shia school of thought. So these are three uh, theological school of thought. Inshallah, we will discuss in detail. But at this stage, we only need to know and we need to understand uh, their names only. And then uh, he says, however, the truth is that, however, the truth is that, Rational argumentation about Islamic doctrines starts with the Holy Quran itself. Now it's uh, Ayatollah Mutahari is mentioning very important aspect. So after discussing this uh, historically, when he said that historically what happened and how, uh, how ilm -e kalam or how Islamic theology emerged, but now he's saying that basically theological issues were already mentioned in the Quran. And Quran is already uh, giving rational arguments. So if we read Quran, if we try to understand Quran, this is very interesting and very important aspect that Quran is establishing very important rational principles. You can see rationality there, you can see logical arguments there, you can see philosophical arguments in the Quran. And Quran is also inviting all of us to think, to ponder over, and to uh, always have thinking ability. And if we are not able to understand something, so we should not accept it. So Quran is always inviting us to think, inviting us to have logical approach in our life. So this is what's saying, and after that we see the sermons of Imam Ali Salam in Nahjul Balagha, and Nahjul Balagha is again full of logical arguments. So we can see that theological uh, aspects were already there from the beginning of Islam in the Quran and Nahjul Balagha. So one cannot say that uh, this ilm -e kalam or this theology uh, has come from outside. So within the Islamic tradition and Islamic culture, we see that Quran is always discussing a theology, logic, philosophy in detail. So inshallah, hopefully uh, the objective and the goal of this course is also the learning goal is once we have understood uh, these sciences and the branches, then we can easily understand Quranic verses. This will help us to understand the arguments, the logic of Quran, and we can understand in, at the deeper level. So now the next issue is about uh, inquiry uh, or imitation. So the Holy Quran has laid the foundation of faith and belief on thought and reasoning. 
which always we already discussed this one the thoughts and reasoning are important so throughout the quran insists that men should attain faith through the agency of thought so you know that this aspect is again very important for us for example if today we are muslim or we are shia so this is our faith this is our iman but quran is insisting us that we need to attain the faith we have to have this faith through the agency of thought it means that we need to understand ourselves we need to pay attention we need to have a strong uh, logical basis for our faith we should not just say and we could not just say that because my parents were muslim my environment was islamic i born in uh, islamic family so this is why i am uh, muslim now so this is not acceptable the important thing is according to the quran that your faith should be based on your own intellectual grounds you should be able to understand that why you are believing in something so then you should believe in otherwise for example if someone is uh, just impressing you or someone is you are being attracted to someone as we know that nowadays for example you like someone on youtube and then you see that there is a speaker and then you are attracted to this speaker and that you are believing the same but he is basically uh, inviting you for this so this is not a uh, right thing according to the quran so then again he says that uh, in the view of the quran intellectual uh, servitude is not sufficient for believing you cannot be like submissive to something intellectually you cannot be submissive to you have to have your argument and understanding its basic doctrines so we need to understand so accordingly one should take up rational inquiry of the basic principles and doctrine of the faith so for example the belief that god is one should be arrived at rationally so if rationally we have understanding of god that god is one then it is good then it should be part of our faith the same is true of the prophethood of muhammad so this requirement resulted in the establishment of ilm usul during the first century so we now understand that why we have ilm usul and why we have this aqaid system so uh, there were many reasons which led to the unprecedented Uh, realization of the necessity of the study of fundamentals of islamic faith amongst muslims and the task of defending them and realization which led to the emergence of prominent mutakallimin during the second third and fourth centuries so this is why because there was need for the arguments uh, logical basis and we need to defend our faith we need to know what we are believing in so this is why we see in the islamic histories there are mutakallimin there are theologians they are always there to help us because we are not able to understand even our faith there must be some people specialist who can uh, help us who can assist us so they will let us know for example you want to ask this question i want to believe in god but i am doubtful whether god is existing or not so they these people are there and they are trained for this and they are helping you to uh, have the logical arguments about that so these were uh, uh, embracing of islam by various nations who uh, brought with them a series of alien ideas and notions mixing and coexistence the muslims with people of various religions so you know in the uh, second century first century of islam so various nations were there who uh, brought with them series of alien ideas and notions 
This is very interesting aspect mentioned, being mentioned by Ayatollah Mutani. He's saying that when other nations uh, were becoming Muslims, they embraced uh, Islam, but they were, they had their own thoughts. They had their own ideas. They had their own approaches. They had their own behavior. So they were mixing up with Muslims. And when they were mixing up with Muslims, so they are challenging them. It was very difficult for Muslims. For example, I will give you example. For example, today, uh, if a Christian become Muslims, so he will not just be Muslim like us, me and you. He will have a lot of other backgrounds, theological backgrounds uh, related to his faith or her faith. So when he is becoming Muslim, so he's asking a lot of questions uh, because his background is different. Uh, so one must be able to respond to this, uh, these people. So this is why Ayatollah Mutari says, such as the Jews, the Christians, the Magians, the uh, Sebastian, and, the, uh, and then religious debates were there at that time between Muslim and those people uh, so those who were uh, who had non-Muslim background. So this is why generally what he's going to say is that now we understand the importance of theology, the importance of knowing our belief uh, rationally. If we are lacking rational grounds, then how we can defend ourselves, how we can uh, promote our religion when we are in the situation and people are asking something, a lot of, uh, in Islamic culture, so a lot of groups are there. These groups are basically defaming Islam. They are killing innocent people in the name of Islam. So people are questioning us, people are asking us, there is an Islamophobia. So if we are not well equipped, if we are not able to understand them, then how we can uh, defend our religion. This is why uh, this Islamic theology is extremely important for us to understand and to know. And then he says the first problem. So first problem is apparently the first problem which was discussed and debated by the Muslims was that of predestination and free will. So uh, I don't want to discuss this issue now. Uh, this will be the part of uh, the contents of theology. So whenever we are ready for this, so uh, these are important chapters of Islamic theology. We need to go into more detail uh, about that to know whether uh, whatever we are doing, our actions are based on our free will or no, we are compelled to do this and there is a compulsion for us. So this is uh, the issue that we are not going to discuss uh, now. But uh, again, the next issue is in this book, Al-Kalam Al-Aqli and Al-Kalam Al-Naqli. So this is very important to understand exactly uh, the meaning of Kalam of Aqli and Kalam of Naqli. He say, although ilm kalam is rational and discursive discipline, it consists of two parts from the viewpoint of the preliminaries and fundamentals issues by it in arguments. So first aspect of theology is akal or rational. So, and the second is uh, nakli. So whenever we are talking about theological issues, so we need to understand that some of our beliefs are based on our akal and they are rational and some are not. Some are based on ahadith, sayings of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him or our imams. So this is called nakli or transmitted or tra traditional. So sunnat is there, tradition is there. So narrations are there, sayings of prophets are there. So both are must be there to form our uh, aqidah and our belief system. 
he says the akal part of kalam consists of the material which is purely rational and if there is any reference to nakli like tradition it is for the sake of illumination and confirmation of a rational judgment but in problems such as those related to divine unity prophethood and some issues of resurrections reference to nakl the book and the prophet of sunna is not sufficient the argument must be purely rational so now this is very important issue i'm just going to explain it what ayatullah mutahri is saying he is saying that uh, there are some very fundamental issues in our belief system we are not allowed to take help even from quran from a hadith we need to have our a uh, logical basis and rational approach to understand this one for example he is saying we need to talk about the existence of god for example this is a question for us whether god is existing or god is not existing so for example if someone says to us quran is saying that god is existing so i will ask this question quran comes after that first i have to understand whether god is there or not if it is proved for me that god is not there then quran has no value for me similarly if sayings of prophet muhammad are there and prophet says that god is existing so i cannot accept this one because these are the fundamental beliefs we need to have intellectual grounds for this one and purely rational arguments are required for us to know that god is existing god is one the day of judgment is there or like prophethood so for example there is a question so why we need prophets why allah is appointing uh, so many prophets for us so uh, this may be a question you cannot say that okay quran is saying to hadith and sayings of prophet and imams so we have prophets of god but the question is why why we need prophets why we were uh, not able to understand the truth without prophets of god so we need to have arguments for this we need to understand this intellectually otherwise uh, this will not help us so you can gradually understand the importance of ilm e kalam and we will understand the basic structure of islamic belief if we don't have this understanding we are seriously we will have deficiencies and we will really lacking uh, in so many areas so now uh, he is talking about what is the nakli so the nakli part of kalam is although it consists of issues related to with the doctrines of the faith and it is necessary to believe in them but since these issues are subordinate to the issue of prophethood it is enough to quote evidence from the divine revelation or the definite ahadith of the prophet in issues linked with imama for example day of judgment so he is saying that there are sub Uh, categories there are sub uh, subordinate uh, issues so we can go and see a hadith for example we don't know about uh, our prayers we don't know that fajr prayer should be two rakat and zohar should be four rakat so there is no possibility for us for the rational uh, approach we cannot prove this by our intellect that in in the fajr time we should offer two rakat prayers so if there is a hadith if there is a quranic verse so we will consult it so it is okay so now this is why we understand that theology is mixture of uh sayings of prophet and imams a hadith or traditions and our aqal so both should be there similarly you know that we have usul din the principles of religion so in usul din we say that we believe in god in tauhid in nubuwwat in imamat in qiyamah we 
uh, we have to have a rational approach to understand usul e deen there is no taqlid in it this is what he is saying uh, about the uh, about the taqlid that he is saying that we are not allowed for this to imitate someone we need to understand ourselves we need to have these logical arguments so we will stop here uh, this uh, today's session and then if you have any question because i had lot of problems in understanding the zoom system and then inshallah next time i will be able to uh, handle all these problems and issues so uh, i will you can unmute yourself you want to talk you want to share something you want to suggest something we can discuss together So uh, I think one by one, if one person is talking, then uh, so other per other people should mute themselves. Yeah. So uh, first of all, Maryam, you want to say something? You can talk. <laughs> Are you not mute? Do you want to say something? Uh, yes, um, Assalamu Alaikum. Assalamu Alaikum uh, Ji. My name is Mariam and I'm asking this question on behalf of my son, Qasim yeah. Hussain. Uh, yeah. He's uh, kind of being shy right now, I guess. Uh, okay. We were having a discussion just in fact yesterday um, you know, he's, he's 13 year old. So he's, you know, at this stage of his life that he's trying to figure out things, you know, identity and, you know, religion yeah. and, and he, you know, and, and it's, it was an ex excellent lecture actually, because it was, you know, yeah. uh, he did mention that, is he going to answer these questions? I said, yes. And eventually in the next lectures, he will answer these questions, you know, about presence of God and, you know, uh, uh, and the other question that he actually you know, was, was, um, you know, posing just yesterday was the purpose of our existence. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. It's not the purpose of our existence. It's a test of the person. Of Go ahead. Okay. okay. So, uh, my question wasn't exactly what is the purpose of our existence, like our, as in humanity, human stuff like that. Cause I already know that it's a, uh, Quran said that it's to test us and test what we're going to do. But like, what is the purpose of a single individual person's existence? Like what's that, that's purpose. Like, okay. What is your name? Qasim Hussain. Okay. Qasim, uh, there is no doubt that this is excellent question. And so very, very important question. And, uh, this is basic question for us that, uh, why, what is the goal of our creation and what is the purpose of our creation? But I think we uh, need to first understand that uh, although I have some lectures, I can forward it to you. Uh, this, uh, in detail, I respond to this question. Uh, recently, I gave uh, one or two lectures on purpose of creation. So these lectures are in Urdu. I don't know you are able to understand or your mom can explain for you. Uh, but the issue is that we are, the course we have started, this is uh, the just beginning. And once you have completed this one, so you may have a lot of questions in your mind, but just keep these questions. So we will answer these questions after, once we have finished the theology. 
and everything should be gradually and step by step. So exactly I would uh, recommend that you pay attention to exactly what we are talking now. I know that other participants are there, they have a lot of theological questions and this will be very interesting. Uh, the sessions will be very interesting for us when we are starting to respond the individual's questions. But at this level, I just want to confine myself to exactly the text we are reading. Because for example, if you're asking about the existence of God, if you are asking about the purpose of creation, but before this, you need to know exactly what we are studying now. For example, if uh, today we discussed about the sayings of prophets and the, the portion of our intellect. So we need to use our intellect and we need to consult what prophet and Quran is saying. So this information is very important for us when I am going to respond to you. For example, you are asking me about the purpose of creation. I will bring some verses for you. So then you will know that exactly uh, I should consult Quran. I should uh, have faith in it. Yeah. So inshallah, we will discuss this, but it's too early to answer this one. So you uh, try to just confine whatever we are reading and what we are, we are studying. I uh, assure you, that once you have completed this, this is a very short course. So then we may have one or two sessions that if you have general questions, so we will respond to these questions. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. So inshallah, uh, so we will have our next session on next Friday. So till that time, inshallah, khuda hafiz, take care.